I'll make it on to. I should say that at the beginning, I've known Scott for a long time, and I've learned so much from him, and he's been my, uh, my inspiration, and my whatever he said, I it goes goes well. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, a number of years ago, I, I spent a fall shooting trap with some friends of mine. And uh, it's kind of a space-time problem. The clay pigeon comes up, and you have the shotgun, and you shoot uh, not at the object, but uh, you know, in front of the object. And if the trajectory of your shot and the trajectory of the clay pigeon uh, connect, then you then you hit the you hit the, the, the target. So theoretically, you ought to be able to do that with Mars. You ought to be able to choose spaceship and figure out exactly where it's, you know, where Mars is and have Mars come around and the spaceship should just hit Mars. But in fact, if you, if you do that, you guarantee you miss Mars. And why is that? That's because Mars is on a completely different grid. Mars is not on the same, it's not in the same space that Earth is in. And the way we usually say that is to say that the, the relative velocities of Earth and Mars are such that uh, special relativity uh, uh, con concerns are crucial, and therefore you have to use the Lorentz transformation uh, to make it work out. But what does the Lorentz transformation transform? It transforms the grid that's attached to Mars so that it looks like the grid that's attached to Earth. So really there are, even in the solar system, there are many spaces in the same space at the same time. Now, this is a very sophisticated thing, but I understand it in a simple way. Think, uh, uh, consider it as a uh, decision tree. You have uh, three crossings a knot with three crossings on the, on the lower left, and you want to get to the, the point where there's no more crossings, you can insert a saddle shape, and you could do one, and then you could do two, and then you could do three, or you could do start with two, and then do one, and then do three, and all those different possibilities are, are traced out in this, in this cube. And speaking classically, we would say one of these is the route that was taken, one of these is the history of the event, but I believe this was meant to be a model of quantum phenomena, and so you can't say exactly for sure which route was taken. And it certainly seems to be true in many cases that more than one route was taken from the past to the present. So there are more uh, events have multiple histories, and the, and the problem with understanding quantum uh, phenomenon is understanding how all these different spaces, how all these different timelines or world lines can all be laying one on top of another so we see it as one line. And so I think in this circumstance also there are many spaces in the same space. And this is my dog Missy and uh, we have a very complete relationship and I'm very happy with Missy but when I start to talk to Missy about special relativity, this is the look I get. <laughs> so I take this as, as, a, as an emblem that this is also our psychological reality. We are many people in the same space. We are many people in the same person. Uh, uh, we have multiple roles to play. And uh, uh, so I think we are many people in the same space person, many spaces in the same space at the same time. So that's where I start. That's my proposition. How, how do we depict, make a model for, have a way of experiencing <coughs> the real situation that we are dealt, which is that the space of this room cannot be just infinitely extended as a three-dimensional bottom. <clears throat> and that, that fits all of our experience. So my first idea was to put the three spaces 
three different spaces side by side in a painting. And so I'd have a painting with uh, <coughs> a perspective space or uh, in the middle a bas relief space and on the end a, uh, a flat space, a frontal space. I have three spaces in the same place at the same time or at least three spaces in the same painting at the same time. And uh, these are, uh, I like this painting a lot, uh, but it's not very sophisticated implementation of the idea that I just laid out for you. Here's a more abstract version. It's actually a little bit earlier. Uh, and you have, and there's an attempt to try to integrate these spaces or somehow make the different spaces in the same place at the same time. But again, they're just juxtaposed. And then I had a, uh, I, I started finding out about four-dimensional geometry. And uh, I, I started studying physics as a way of learning four-dimensional geometry rather than the other way around. And then I found out about computer visualizations of four-dimensional figures. And this really uh, changed my work. If you think of this painting as being a triptych, uh, 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 having uh, hinges, and you fold the painting in upon itself, you start getting work like, like this. Uh, so you have a number of different planes um, that put the viewer in a number of different locations, and these planes are not only overlapped, but they're, they're interwoven um, in ways that are paradoxical in three dimensions, but would be the natural consequence of, of, uh, of being in four dimensions and, and being uh, reduced, pressed, projected in the three-dimensional space. And here's another example. Uh, they, you know, starting, starting from here, <coughs> they, you can elaborate and they become richer and, and richer. Uh, and there's another one picture of the same painting. Um, and uh, <coughs> finally, they can get very, very complicated. And, and there's, uh, uh, like, like Scott's work that Scott just showed you, there's, a, there's an attempt to define the space by, um, by tessellating uh, hypercubes or, or uh, portions of hypercubes. We've discovered that <coughs> if I try to run these software that I wrote, it, it crashes the system. So I'm not going to show it to you, except to say that uh, uh, I, I actually believe that this is the first computer visualization of hypercubic tessellations. And uh, uh, I, I have a little story to tell. I was racking my brains. How, did, how, how, how would you fit hypercubes together? And if you just sort of say it that way, it's impossible to answer. Uh, but I had, uh, I had a way of writing to Coxeter, and I wrote him, how, how do you tessellate hypercubes? He wrote me back this like four sentence letter with a little diagram, and it was completely clear. You just tessellate. Forward and backward, and up and down and in and out, and forward and backward in the fourth dimension. So that's what I did. So every cube is a cube in precisely two hypercubes. And it's a, it's a nice program. Yeah, actually, you can download it from my web. It's, it's, it's a very primitive uh, in, uh, program. And um, I got another idea uh, from playing with those programs. There's a feature of, uh, you know, you can rotate, uh, <coughs> you can rotate a, ah, here I am. You can rotate a uh, piece of paper around a point, two-dimensional. You can rotate a three-dimensional object, let's say it's stick, around a line. And you can rotate a four-dimensional object around a plane. And this is something that was actually known at the end of the 19th century. I discovered the guy who, who wrote this paper about it. Um, <clears throat> but we didn't really understand what that meant and how it looked and how it behaved until we put them on computers. And so what I found was a very uh, low-tech way of showing planar rotation. I suppose, strictly speaking, it's not, uh, but uh, 
you have two-dimensional objects, painted lines, and three-dimensional objects, welded steel rods, and uh, I've gone to a lot of trouble so that you can't really tell which is which unless you move. And then when you move, they, they rotate and they behave, they hide, uh, cells can be hidden behind uh, planes. Uh, the, the sort of visual phenomenon you see when we're playing with the, uh, the hypercube uh, on the computer. The one difference is that the plane of rotation is not in the origin. The plane of rotation is a, a face of, of one of the cells. Uh, and you don't get all of the effects, but you do get some. And then there's something else that's going on here uh, where I'm trying to uh, make a model of the non-Euclidean surface. Of, so kind of, uh, uh, but I, I got another idea, which was that since the three-dimensional objects and the two-dimensional objects taken together provide the visual information of a four-dimensional figure, wouldn't it be elegant to have the two-dimensional figures be the actual cast shadow? In other words, the, four dimension, the three-dimensional objects and the two-dimensional objects are the shadow of the fourth dimension. So why not have the two-dimensional objects be the shadow of the three-dimensional objects and those items taken together be the shadow of the, of the four dimensional figure. So these these works from eighty six you you can you can wear three D glasses, now I look at glasses, and you take the red image and the blue image and fuse them together and uh, so now you have two things in the same place at the same time. And as you pass by, they rotate against one another in ways which are characteristic of planar rotation. I guess I should have explained that um, this is a relief sculpture. This is welded steel, and it's lit by a red light and a blue light. Where they shine together, they make the white light. When you block out the red, you get a blue line. When you block out the blue, you get a red line. And that's why you have anaglyphic uh, glasses. So these works uh, attempt to show plane and rotation as a way of learning to see four-dimensional space as a way of having a model for our experience. And <coughs> I went on from there to study uh, quasi-crystals, which it turns out are also projections of uh, um, more regular structures in higher dimensional space. And here again, uh, if I run the program, it crashes. So I won't. But here uh, below you have a dome. Right above it you have uh, the plan of the dome or the shadow of the dome at noon. And you can see the five-fold symmetry. Uh, to the left uh, is the shadow at 10 in the morning. And uh, to the right is the shadow of 2 in the afternoon. And you have three-fold, five-fold, and two-fold symmetry in the same object. And to me, that was in many spaces in the same space at the same time. I, I got a chance to build a, a large-scale uh, quasi-crystal in Denmark. And um, it, it, uh, you can see the shadow on the floor. And it really did work uh, that you walked around the structure above and below. And there was a bridge that passed through the structure. And you, you would uh, sort of see this kind of mess of stuff, and then you would take a step, and all of a sudden it would become something made out of triangles. And then you'd kind of walk around, oh, something made out of squares, and something <coughs> made out of uh, uh, star pentagons. Here's another uh, photograph of The wonderful thing about quasi crystals is, uh, of course, the off. All the nodes are the same in the same orientation. All the rods are the same length. All the planes are the same plane. They make cells of only two kinds. They make subassemblies of only uh, four kinds. Three, three more than one of them. Uh, and there's all this incredible, they're in rows and columns. There's all this incredible standardization. And yet we have a aperiodic structure with simultaneous five-fold, three-fold, two-fold symmetry. Is somebody ever in Denmark? Was it the, this, uh, they might have uh, known. Uh, George Francis uh, has uh, been trying to uh, 
implement this in the cave and, and uh, I guess the, the student who's made the most progress was uh, Matt, uh, Matt Gregory and uh, it's now sort of implemented in the cube. I don't know if Scott saw it. I, I haven't had a chance to really see it yet. But the, uh, this could be just really a fascinating uh, mathematical tool for uh, changing initial parameters, seeing how the quasi-crystal uh, breaks apart and reforms itself in a different configuration and really understanding the, the cell assemblies and how, how they work and being able to walk through this thing and pick out parts of it. Uh, uh, I think it's a great way to see quantum crystals. And uh, a after, uh, after the Denmark project was finished, I started uh, doing some more paintings. Paintings like, like my first paintings, except that now the planes are lattices, three-dimensional lattices, and they're all twisted and curved. And I, I suppose this really comes out of uh, conversations with Scott and uh, trying to read his books and thinking about braiding uh, surfaces. You know, if you have a two-dimensional sheet and you want to treat it as a, not as a ribbon, but as a sheet, and you want to tie it in a knot, you have to have access to four dimensions. That to go over and under itself. And if, you, if, if the sheet were to have a thickness, it would be a lattice, be identified with a color, maybe with an internal structure, such as a tessellated octahedra or a dodecahedra, uh, then you could sort of braid these in higher dimensional space, maybe in five dimensional space, and when they would be projected down into three dimensional space, they would self intersect and you would have these impossible twisted, impossible overlaying. Them. And the painting is marvelous for that because you can you can paint these transparencies. And uh, so the goal is to try to see see the lattices as separate entities and then try to see multiple lattices and to try to see them um, all uh, intertwined and overlapping in paradoxical ways. Um, I'll show you a few more. And, um, maybe I'll, I'll settle on, on one. I recognize some stuff here, not not. Um, let's take this one for example. Uh, look at the orange line, uh, the ye they're yellow, uh, yellowish orange lines. Uh, <clears throat> this is a quasi crystal pattern in the, in the five fold symmetry relationship. So these are cells, uh, single cells of, of, of quasi crystal. Uh, and another structure is the light blue structure and um, their octahedra. Their octahedra is uh, tessellated point to point and they're bent in a kind of parabolic fashion, a kind of a nose cone. And uh, can you see the red lines? Uh, not so well maybe, but there, there are red lines. There are two cell groupings of uh, hypercubes, in other words, two cells of the hypercube, and, and they are uh, torqued in a uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, parabola. And there are some light blue lines. Um, they're dodecahedra, and so there's a field of dodecahedra, and they're frontal. And, um, then there's some some other green lines, make little scars. That's a two-dimensional pattern of uh, that comes from a Persian dome, and they are also a, sort of in this spherical dome shape. And all of these lattices and patterns are interwoven, and pass through and over above one another. Here's here's the last painting that I'm going to show you. 
from 2005. Different patterns are more clearly visible. So that's, I'm going to end there. Mm -hmm. Unless you have any questions. Yes, sir. look at it for a while because you start to see the different overlapping lattices. I'm curious about two things. What are the scale of your paintings in general? Uh, these paintings are 56 by 70. Okay. Yeah, that would be quite a different experience seeing it first right. Time, right in front of it. Um, and I'm also curious, um, I, I really like your line quality. Do you do that by hand? Uh, I, I invented a tool like a, uh, a striking tool, uh -huh. uh, like a mini roller, and they're rolled out okay. on it with a straight edge. Interesting. And, and what about, I mean, because sometimes they're straight, but you also have this, you know, very slight curvature on some of the lattices. Right. Is that, their each segment is still straight? Right. Okay. So these aren't computer generated? Well, the lattices are computer generated. And I, I also do <coughs> some prints, which are, which go directly from the computer through the internet to the printer. But these are um, these are sort of composed on the canvas and, and through a computer projector. So I have I have individual lattices, and uh, the lattices can be you know then manipulated and uh, they're laid up one at a time, chalked in, and then painted in. And the, the lattices are generated by uh, two different kinds of programs. One is a program that I wrote, and another is a program um, from England called Form, which is a <coughs> pattern generation program, it's a public domain program. And uh, it's not user friendly, it's hard to use, but it's, it's very efficient in terms of, and it works in any dimension. It, it's oblivious to what it's five dimension or ten dimension or whatever. And uh, there are many features for for curving and working. And uh, so I use that to generate the patterns. The lattice is what you call it. Yes. I want to ask you the same question that we asked Scott, which is have you felt some sort of new relationship with 4D in your head? Something goes. <laughs> You know, it's the answer. You know, there have been times when I. Heinz von Foster, I don't know if you, you know the name. Uh, he was a psychologist of perception, and uh, he was a follower of Piaget. And he wanted to, to study uh, the acquisition of visual comprehension, spatial comprehension in adults. And he thought a model for that would be if, could they do this, uh, could they learn four dimensions? And uh, uh, this is in the 70s. And he had this, this gigantic computer that he sat down and had and looked through the little scope. And uh, he would learn to see the fourth dimension. Now, according to Heinz, he could take anybody, uh, undergraduate, and in 15 weeks flat, teach them to see the fourth dimension. And he said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, could they do puzzles in the fourth dimension? Could they anticipate uh, rotations? Could they distinguish between legal and illegal moves? And uh, he had about five or six things that were his criteria. And according to him, anybody could do it. And, but you know, I've asked this to Scott, and I've asked this to Ben Schaff, I've asked this to you know physicists and you know Ben uh, And you always get the, the same answer. Right? You know, sometimes I think they're giving. So the question is whether you're uh, one more thing. The question is whether you're hardwired for three dimensions, or whether it's a uh, cultural experience. You know, and I, I spent a whole decades arguing that it's all cultural and that you can learn to do it. And stuff like that. But I don't know. <coughs> You've got a large body of work from 2005 to the present. Do you have any 
for research? Uh, or is it? Uh, I don't think I, I have any on here. Yes. Well, when you project from the fourth dimension to three dimensions, you lose information. When you project four dimensions to two dimensions, you lose even more information. And then, you know, if you project down the line, it's lost all. Yeah. Well, it's actually, I wanted to address what you said, which is that we wouldn't it be better if you had three dimensions? Right. And the answer is no, because you cannot you cannot uh, do planar rotation in three dimensions, right? You, uh, for example, if, uh, this is an example from my book, but I think it's a, is this, what is this? Is this a sample of projection of the cube? Are you sure? It's not no. four trapezoids and a square? Yeah, how can you tell the difference? If you have a second image. And then no, 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 if you rotate it. Does that help you? No. No, <laughs> Before you can bend, when you finish. But if I had a cube, a real cube, and I projected it on the, the surface, and I were to rotate the cube in its own space, which is different from rotating the projection, and I will watch the change, of the of the projection, then I would then I would be able to tell whether it was a cube or whether it was a tile pattern. And so, actually, I think uh, two dimensions, especially if you can make kinesthetic two dimensional images, uh, are more revealing than uh, the three dimensional projections. You could, once you project it, it's done. It's fixed. It has no more information. Um, I'm astonished about the fact that since lately the projector in Princeton yeah. is more or less forgotten. He wrote this pretty journey in four dimensions. Of course, also three dimensions you cannot reconstruct from one picture. You need at least two. So I know him. I mean, I know his book. I have his book. But he's not the only one. <laughs> I mean, this goes way back. It's 50 years ago. Yeah, okay, it goes back, uh, uh, you know, the, the first drawings of, of hypercubic figures and, uh, was 1980, uh, 1880. 1880. Yeah. But I, I, I do I, I agree, he, he's not on everybody's uh, Another question? Well, thank you very much.